here we go, another action pack impact review, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to say this early. <coughs> Excuse me. Allergies. I am a New Yorker. I've said this before and I'll say it again. I love New York. It's got a great amount of stuff in it. In a sense, you got a little world inside a city. But I don't want to continually see and continually see and continually see and continually see so many impact tapings. Oh my god, man. I'm hoping this is the last one and then moving on to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, wherever the hell they were talking about in this impact. Seeing the same environment is almost like seeing Orlando, Florida's impact tapings. I'm sorry. I just want them to move on. <coughs> Excuse me. But you get my point. Let's just hope now they're going to move on to a new venue. Now, how was the show? I'll say this. There was a lot of progression in this show for the characters as well as for the storylines. Was it all good? You're about to find out. I want to start with hmm, the bromance. Yes, I'm starting with the bromance. You know why? Because I felt like two segments could have been devoted better two matches because there were two matches that were too short that could have been longer that I would have liked to see I'm being honest here but let me get the bromance dealing with the beautiful people over with right now do I actually care no I am in love with Angelina Love I love me some Velvet Sky they both are beautiful physically beautiful women and I've said this before and I'll say it again with Angelina Love she at one moment at a certain point in the light, has the most gorgeous face. And other turns, huh? You don't know what type of look you get from her at other turns. Like, she's not ugly at all. Not at all in any turn. But you don't know what to put on certain angles of the light in her face. You just don't know. But what about, what, am I interested in this? No. Because in the end, I don't believe this is going to end out well. I believe this is going to be a feud between... Robbie E. and Jesse Goddard's. This is what I think might happen. You guys tell me below. I really want to know. But that's all I'm going to say. Now I'm going to mention the matches I believe got short change because of this. One, Rhino versus Rockstar Spud. Now the early part of the night when Rockstar Spud and AC3 came out and said, I'm not leaving here. I'm going to keep fighting. I'm going to get what I want. I'm really good as a wrestler. I'm really great. The hardcore American icon still gives us something pretty good. He's already beat the crap out of Rhino twice. He got his comeuppance a little bit from Rhino. Okay, that's okay. You gotta let Rhino get in a little bit because the crowd still loves ECW too much if you did it that way. But the thing that upsets me because this is looking like a breakup between two very entertaining people. Rockstar Spud is thrown to Rhino as a sacrificial lamb. And when you see just before the match with EC3 and Spud himself, he says simply, I've done what I needed to for my Aunt D. But what have you done? It's your turn or you're fired. And my best friend Paulie said one time, either walk out the door or walk out the ring walk out to the ring my mistake but in the end Spud gets demolished and that's not something we're, we're going to be surprised about Spud was going to get demolished with this but because it was so short it was maybe two or three minutes and I'm sure you're going to say well he's not supposed to last more than two or three minutes it's not that it was the point that the promo segment between those three was short the match, which was understandable, needed to be short, felt it could have been longer by maybe a couple of more minutes, two or three minutes. You could have given Spud five minutes of time, TNA, because the crowd really wants to cheer for him. They do. They want to see more from EC3. You know what could have happened? You could have had Spud roll out of the ring, walk up to EC3, and gets killed by EC3. He just clotheslined his ass. And then he looks back at Rhino with that look like, I mean, it's not one of the greatest things you can do, but it would make the storyline more understandable. 
He's destroying everyone that let him down. And I know this kind of goes into it, but for me personally, I would have liked two more minutes for Spud. Because I believe that the crowd really wants to chant for him. He's that lovable of a person. The second match I felt was just way, it needed at least five more minutes, was Rude and Eli. Now, it was not the best match of the night, but it was a very good match. But I felt that in this respect between Eli and Bobby Roode, they could have gotten another five or six or four minutes. They deserved more time, but because of the bromance and, well, let's be honest, the bromance and beautiful people are not doing that well. Putting them together doesn't mean it's going to be a great thing, but you could have left this for next week. Bromance and them could have been left for next week. And I feel that they could have gotten more time. But here's the question for Eli. Is he turning heel? He looked way too frustrated. That's the beginning of what a heel would normally do. That used to be a face. And dealing with an old friend. He would get totally frustrated and wants to get something back. I have a feeling they're going to have another match. Even if Rude wins or loses against, against Lashley, we're going to get another match. You need to have someone to go up against Rude, and I believe that Eli might fit the bill. He's not a 100% great face. He's a generic face. But I personally have never seen Eli turn heel. If you have, tell me below if it was good or not. But it will be interesting to see someone who's been a generic face and a comedian for so long turn dark. Now, the Bram and Magnus versus Sean Gunner. We've always wondered when is one of those three, and I'm talking about Anderson, Shaw, and Gunner, going to turn heel. We didn't know who was going to do it. We were getting hints that Anderson was going to do it, but because of Chris Ramirez, sorry, I mispronounced his name, not great with names, Chris Ramirez, it looks like he's going to stay face, like we always thought he should be. He should not turn heel. So now we got Gunner and we have Shaw. And my felt what feelings was that Shaw was going to eventually turn heel, which I thought was not a very good thing. But now that he's having a conflict a little bit with Shaw, because he got dressed up in Gunner's, well, not Gunner's, but Chris Ramirez's uniform, and then he tags himself in during the match, and then does not try to help Gunner when he got his leg clipped and acted nutty and tried to take out the ref because of it, you now think that it's going to be finally Gunner who's going to turn heel because he gets tired of Shaw acting idiotic. Unless you're going to be stupid enough to turn Shaw heel, which I think is not a wise thing to do. He was a good heel, but at this moment I think people want to see him as a face, even if he can't pull off that well. But that's what I'm thinking. And you guys tell me below how hot that woman in the background was when she was looking at Shaw. Curling her hair wearing a very, very tight push-up bra, how hot she looked. Because she looked very good. She did. Now, the... Why not get it over with? The six-man tag for the X Division number one contendership was not badly done. It was done at a good amount of time compared to what happened in the number one contenders between Rude and Eli. But this one was all right. It was at a good amount of time. But here's a problem. There's still no story behind this. There's no feud behind this. Seeing Homicide win over a Manic really doesn't 100% interest me. I'm sorry. I just don't care. I almost thought Loki was going to get a third shot at this. But they let Homicide do it. And that's understandable. But where is the fucking feud for the X Division? They're just throwing out matches. Mind you, I'm glad to see them. But it's just not enough for the X Division champion. But, and I could have left this at the end. But, seeing, oof, I don't know where they're going and how far they're going to go with this. And it does upset me that the X Division feels like it's being used as a plot device. Almost. But seeing James Storm kidnap a second person in a matic to try and turn him into another one of his slave, his controlled follower, as you will, is really good. I really enjoyed the segment he did. I really enjoyed what happened with 
the great Sonata. I really hope to give Sonata new music because he really needs it. And then after that, a little later, Austin Aries. That was good. Austin Aries always makes a good segment. But this segment with Storm was so good. It was the best one of the night. It was. If anyone didn't think so, explain to me why it wasn't the best point of any promo in the night. And then seeing... Whew, I haven't seen Kajiri in years. I think the last time I saw Kajiri was maybe 2010, 2009. I can't remember the last time I seen a Kajiri. And since he's been in Wrestle 1, which I don't really watch Japanese pro wrestling. And I might consider it if I can find a place I can actually watch it. But... Seeing Kajiri was great to see. It was kind of weird without the mustache and beard. I'm sorry. He looks more menacing with a mustache and a beard. That's just me. He looks way too clean shaven. He doesn't look rugged enough. When they call him the Japanese buzzsaw, he should be a Japanese buzzsaw. Someone who can just tear through you like you're nothing. But you guys tell me below. Did you hear anything about Kajiri being brought to TNA? Other than Twitter and Facebook? If they even did it, hearing Taz said, I've been hearing for a while that Kajiri is coming to TNA. Well, I have it. Why didn't they announce this shit? Ugh, a V8 moment. Gotta do it like that. Now, two more matches left to do. First one I'm going to talk about is Lashley versus Samoa Joe. And I gotta say, Samoa Joe talked very well in the beginning of the show. He did. As we always know, you always, always get a good promo out of an MVP. We do. He helps set it up. Kenny King still angers me because he's still skipping along like a little five-year-old kid. And I wish he would stop doing that. But in the end, it was still an effective segment. And with security coming out instead of the wrestlers, it felt a little more substantial. By the time this match came out, it wasn't one of the best matches of the night. It was good. But in the end, having a Kenny King come out to help Lashley, it's understandable because they were talking about what was going to happen for Bellator, supposedly, today. Because these are taped. And Lashley had to leave early because he had to prepare for the Bellator match he's going to be doing. <coughs> Excuse me. But in the end, seeing Lashley win was understandable. But they let Samoa Joe deal with Lashley. And Samoa Joe looked so dominant. If it wasn't for a Kenny King helping him, he would have got his ass handed to him because he was about to get choked out. So that makes me think, is something going to happen with Samoa Joe? Maybe when they start doing the Bound for Glory series. And I'm wondering when they're going to start doing it. Because, actually, I don't think they were going to do the Bound for Glory series. They basically left it out. And I feel kind of sad. That should have started by the middle of August. But no one's talked about it. So, I think they just dropped it. But in the end, I think this was a very good segment. Even though I felt having Kenny King out there really wasn't necessary. But it's understandable because they wanted to make Lashley safe for going, to re going into Bellator. That's just me. You can tell me below if it's something entirely different. The last thing I'm going to talk about is the one thing I thought was the best of the entire show. The Knockouts Championship match between Gail Kim and Terrence Terrell. Let's be honest here. A lot of people wanted Terrence Terrell to win. And I admit, I'm one of them. And these ladies can have great matches. And this was the match of the night for me personally. I'm sorry. Seeing all the other matches throughout the night. And I'm going to make sure I don't forget any of the matches. Um, no, I didn't forget anything. But in the end... It was the best match of the night. Seeing Gail Kim take a really nasty bump flying outside the ring the way she did kind of worried me a little bit. Terrence Terrell, on the other hand, getting a neck breaker done on the steel steps where her lower back gets nailed does concern me. Gail, I'm sorry, what were you thinking? You protected yourself by having most of that step. If this woman has a lower back problem because of you, I'm going to be fucking angry at you because... You fucked up. Unless you think she didn't get hurt, that lower back was on edge. She took a very nasty whack to her back. 
I'm just hoping she's okay. In the end, Gail Kim won the match. Which, you, I know a lot of people are going to say, it's not fair. Why couldn't Terrence Terrell win it? To be honest, how well the match was, you could have had both, either one of them win. Both of them wrestling was alright. Both of them, one of them winning, I'm about to say both, one of them winning was okay with me. Particularly what happened at the end with Havoc. Now I've seen this publicity for Havoc. And I know she was in, what was it, Shine. I, I, did, I didn't do a review of Shine, but I did watch it. And I saw Havoc. I don't know if that's her real name, and I can't remember if it was in Shine. But in this respect, Havoc looked very good. That half-shaven head makes her look nasty. And the music, I have to say, is not that great for her. I just don't feel the music was right. But still, she came down to the ring and kicked everybody's ass. Which makes you think now, if Havoc is the one that's going to get the title, that won't be a 100% bad thing. We need some new blood. We need to see something different. Admittedly, even though it didn't matter which one of the knockouts won, I would like to see Terrence Terrell face a Havoc instead of a Gail Kim facing Havoc. But I'm still going that it wasn't a bad segment at all. And it was the match of the night. Duh. So how do I feel about this show? This show was actually a good progressive show. A lot of things were done alright, but why the fuck did they have Robbie Ean and Beautiful People this week? They could have done it next week. Two matches were too damn short because of it. And that was Rockstar Stud and Rhino where they could have had at least, at least a minute or two more. And when it came down to Eli and Rude, they could have had four minutes more. I really felt it was too short. It was roughly about seven to eight minutes. They could have had ten minutes of time or nine minutes of time if they didn't do that stupid segment with Robbie E., Jesse Goddard, the beautiful people, and Zima Ion. I'm sorry. That's just me. But you guys tell me below. So I hope you enjoyed this debate of the week. Please give me a comment below, and you will be seeing my debate of the week. And it's going to be something about the Ice Bucket Challenge. Just watch for it. You'll see it. See ya!